Good day, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. In the meantime, I would like to go over just a few logistical items. The session is being recorded and will be made available on our website. For that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, your lines have been muted. So for questions and comments, we'll be using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We would definitely like to encourage you to use that, so feel free to start typing in your questions throughout the session as they come to mind. Panelists will be typing their responses throughout, and if there is time, we'll select a handful of questions that we will try to cover uh, at the end of today's seminar. Next slide. Great, thank you. So my name is Terry Martin. I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, or NAPSIG. Uh, with me, I have Charlotte Abel and Jared Doak from the team that will be monitoring the chat and troubleshooting any issues, and Paul Doherty, who will be facilitating today. So thank you for joining us in our fifth of uh, this Emergency Management EM Geoforum series. This is a part of a virtual seminar series that we are facilitating on behalf of the Response Geospatial Office within the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. We're partnering to further a shared vision of advancing emergency management throughout the promulgation of best practices and through integration of innovative technology and solutions in day-to-day -day operations. So we're very excited to have you all join us for this topic. I know we are all managing uh, and dealing with the current pandemic on our minds and many of our partners are busy with the current hurricane response. So I am encouraged to see so many folks in attendance today. I did want to mention that we're developing this series in tandem with FEMA's Modeling and Data Working Group. This is a tremendous group that meets monthly, and you're welcome to join those meetings. They cover different topic each month that corresponds with this series. So for example, last week their meeting was on wildfires, and today's session will build off the technical demonstrations that they provided. So for those of you who might have missed that meeting, you can send a request to the email on the screen and get slides from that session. So typically now I would turn it over to Chris Vaughn, who is FEMA's Geospatial Information Officer, um, who had the vision uh, behind this series. So he's tied up today uh, in the current response to Laura, but wanted us to proceed without him. So instead, we're gonna jump right in. I will turn it over to Paul Doherty uh, on the NAPSIG team, who is our Director of Technology Innovation. So over to you, Paul. All right, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. All right, very good. Well, welcome. We're going to talk today about wildfire workflows and especially considerations for emergency management. Uh, we have three great speakers. We're going to start with Skip Adel today, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, who's going to talk a little bit from the uh, national perspective from the National Wildfire Coordination Group. We will turn it over to Chris Stewart, who's going to give a regional perspective from the FEMA office and talk a little bit about how FEMA gets involved in supporting and, uh, and the recovery from fire. And uh, Chris is from Region 9, for those of you in, uh, on the West Coast. And then we'll go over to Ben Ogren from Mariposa County in California, uh, who's a senior GIS specialist who will give us a local perspective. And um, for those that have been to Yosemite, you might have driven through Mariposa County at some point. And uh, obviously, they've dealt with quite a number of complex fires in uh, recent years. A little bit about uh, NAPSIG Foundation, if this is your first call. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're really here for you. Uh, we're built on a, a vision of a nation of emergency responders and leaders that have the tools they need to make decisions, and many of those tools are geospatial in nature. We're built on a platform and a foundation of national guidelines, standards, and best practices. We provide uh, guidance to encourage agencies to go through exercises and simulations to test their tools. Uh, we build capacity through education and training through events like this. And we do at the very tip of the spear and hopefully the least amount of our time provide uh, technical assistance, preferably in advance of disaster. And um, this is a really exciting uh, opportunity to, to bring some great content to you, especially around the topic of wildland fire as we know, it's growing uh, more and more complex. And uh, participation, this is really great to see that we have a large emergency management contingent. Uh, we often find that uh, the, the communications between wildland and fire and emergency management can really be improved through geospatial. So we're happy to have you all here. And um, a large contingent from local government, we're imagining the actual attendance will be down from federal due to the hurricane response. But this is, again, as Terry, 
express is recorded and be shared out through the events website. So today, really, uh, if we're successful, this is what we'll come away with. At the end of the session, you'll have insight into the NIFS ERHS online organization and how that works, the wildfire national, national incident feature services, and integrated report of wildland fire information, otherwise known as Irwin. And Skip's gonna really uh, help to share all that with you. We'll know a little bit more about FEMA's regional support with an example from Region 9. And uh, you should come away with an understanding, especially if you're a local GIS, uh, how you can utilize these national feeds and resources for response efforts. And that's both for your internal maps and your public maps. And I think Mariposa County is a great example of uh, working locally, but also with their neighbors in uh, neighboring counties. So I look forward to this and I hope this gives you all uh, a great start with your wildfire game plan going into the fall. So as I said, we'll start with Skip, who works for the National Park Service as a geospatial fire analyst. He's also the fire GIS program lead for the National Park Service branch of Wildland Fire for the National Interagency Fire Center, uh, which we'll refer to as NIFSI going forward. And that's based in, uh, NIFSI's based in Boise, Idaho. He's focused on spatial data acquisition and management. He's the project lead for the NIFSI ArcGIS Online and work on the National Incident Feature Service. Skip is involved as a GIS specialist in wildfire incident response and the S341 training class, which you'll hear more about today. And I would just like to add that um, Skip and the NIFC and the National Wildfire Coordination Group have just offered amazing leadership to this community and done a great job of centralizing, but also disseminating geospatial information. And I hope to uh, see this in other areas of all hazards response. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Skip. Thanks, Paul, appreciate it. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you today. I want to talk to you a little bit about wild and fire incident support. Uh, of course, it's very timely. Uh, I'm actually on an incident right now supporting <laughs> fires, so taking a little time to do this presentation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, NWCG, uh, who I'm kind of, who I am the chair of the geospatial group, uh, works on standards. And when NWCG was formed, those standards dealt with things like uh, threads on hoses so that fire trucks could uh, work together better without, you know, everybody has the same equipment. That's morphed a lot into uh, data, data exchange, data standards, things like that. So I'll talk to you a little bit this morning about uh, how we really set the foundation for a lot of this success through building of standards and things like that. All right. So, oh, sorry. It's the, uh, can you go back one? <laughs> Thank you. So we talked a little bit about standards. Um, they're really the foundation. They're really the purpose for NWCG. And that's how we, we get everyone to coordinate is, is around those standards. The goal is really to allow the plug and play of, of your GIS people. Um, whether it's people, data, that kind of thing, um, so that we can have common interoperability between the various agencies that might be responding, whether it's someone from the Park Service, whether it's someone from local government, uh, that type of thing. So a little bit of information here uh, about GeoOps. This is our standards for geospatial operations. This was uh, recently updated for the 2020 fire season. Uh, pretty significant for us. The last update was 2014, I believe. And uh, this really gets into the, the what. What do we need to do? Uh, what do we need to be able to produce as GIS folks? And uh, GeoOps as our standard really define things like what's our geodatabase data standards that we use? Um, the National Incident Feature Service, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but it's a, a service that allows for data aggregation. Um, incidents are expected to use that service and then that data is aggregated nationally. Uh, through those shared services. We get into things like directory structures. How do we store our data on, on our local machines in such a way that if someone comes in and replaces us, they can use that same interoperability. Uh, we get into file naming conventions. Those of you in GIS know that there's a tremendous amount of different files that are created during the GIS process. And if we didn't have some sort of naming convention, it would get a little messy or get a lot messy really quick. Uh, the standard GeoOps also gets into symbology. 
we have a core set of symbols that go back 50, 60 years, you know, what a fire perimeter looks like, what an uncontrolled fire edge looks like, that kind of thing. And we've, we've updated and, and turned those into digital products now uh, in GeoOps. We also talk about uh, standard map elements, what we expect to see on, on map products. You know, you need a scale bar, you need a legend, you need things like that. That's all defined in these operation standards as well. Then we get into things like documentation. How do we document the, uh, the process that we're doing? How do we hand that off? So, and uh, I mentioned a little bit about our geodatabase standard. That's, that's really a critical piece and we'll kind of get into how that, how that works and, and why that's such a critical piece uh, in a little bit here. Um, if you have folks, uh, I would encourage them to look at the GeoOps uh, so that they can get up to speed with how uh, GIS folks do their job. So we had the what, which was GeoOps, and then we also have come out with a how, uh, which is what we call the GISS workflow. Pretty simple, uh, but what it really gets into is now, how do we use our tools out there, whether it's software products, whether it's services, whether it's uh, files, hosting, that kind of stuff. How do we use those processes to meet those standards that we have defined? And one of the really main reasons for developing these, these workflows and these standards are, um, you know, to ensure an operability, but it also helps with training. Uh, training is a key thing that uh, the NWCG does. Paul mentioned a little earlier about the S341 class, which is uh, our GIS specialist for incident management class. And that's what we, it's a three day hands on uh, scenario based training that allows folks to practice and get up to speed with, with how to build these products processes uh, that are defined in the, in the workflows and things. Uh, the workflow is changing a lot faster uh, than the geo app side of things. You know, the, the information about how to make a good map, what it needs to contain, that kind of stuff has been static for a while, but the tools that we're using to make those maps, um, whether they're paper or, or now more and more becoming digital products, um, the tools that we use are changing very rapidly. So we've actually put both of these, uh, the workflow and the GeoOps now are on their own website. And that was also released this spring, it's all new. Um, so that we can update those websites very quickly. Uh, each year, uh, we can tend to do that in the winter time, update our standards, update our processes for new software and things like that. So that folks that are going into the field the following season um, can get up to speed. So the workflow is real critical. We step through the various processes that are common to all, uh, all incident response. You've always got your data preparation piece. Um, you've always got a step where you're editing and working with your incident data. And that's gonna occur time and time again, whether it's daily, whether it's hourly, uh, that type of thing. We update our data sets. Uh, we call it the master incident database. Uh, that is then tied into our national incident feature service so that that data is automatically shared up. Whole section there about creating maps and map products, then how we back up and share that information. We have to make sure it's backed up. Uh, they're all federal records. So we have uh, record keeping standards we have to follow. And then there's also ways to share the data. You know, we use everything from FTP sites, ArcGIS Online, um, websites, all that kind of stuff. So we have to set up standards for that. And again, these standards and workflows really help get folks trained and up to speed. So on our website, if you go to look at that, you'll see the steps necessary that you have to follow through to do all this, uh, to meet the job requirements. Someone who's a GIS can pick this up pretty quick. Uh, we also have a lot of fire folks that are not necessarily full-time GIS people um, that are learning and want to get into this, and that helps a lot as well. All right, uh, next slide. So we talked a little bit, uh, or, or Paul mentioned the National Interagency Fire Center earlier. And this really came about because of the fact that these tools and technologies are changing. You know, as we mentioned earlier, ArcGIS Online has been around for a while and we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could integrate that into wildfire incident response. And from a federal standpoint, a lot of our agencies, whether it's Park Service, Forest Service, we have these ArcGIS Online organizations, but they're not necessarily open to those from other places, uh, from other agencies and stuff. Usually it's restricted to employees or cooperators, you know, people who are hired. So what we did is we went out and we uh, bought our own organization. Uh, under our Department of Interior uh, 
license with ESRI, we added another ArcGIS Online org. Did that in uh, about five years ago, 2015. And we spent the first year or two testing it out, seeing how the workflows would work, that kind of stuff. And then starting in 2016, we rolled that out uh, for production use. So it's gone from a few thousand or a few hundred people to start with. Now we're at about 17,000 members in the organization, uh, one of the larger orgs that, uh, our, that ESRI has. Nice part about the NIFSI org is any wildland fire cooperator can request an account. The nice part there is, uh, especially at the state and local level, uh, you might not have access to NIFSI ArcGIS online org. We have unlimited, well, we have 30,000 user cap. We have unlimited credits, that kind of stuff. So we can really uh, provide capacity to local and regional groups uh, who are looking for help, you know, using the on online side of things. We use it for wildfire incident response. We use it for planning uh, a lot, whether it's fuels treatments, whether it's uh, pre-fire planning and structure assessments, things like that. And we also use it a lot for training. The training piece kind of comes back in again. So uh, if you have a, if you're in, in dealing with wild and fire and you'd like to get up to speed on that, feel free, you can reach out right on, right on our homepage is the link for requesting an account. We'll ask how you're tied back into fire, but otherwise uh, there's no restrictions on the number of people in there. Uh, we also have a lot of published workflows in there. Uh, in that homepage about how to use template web maps we've set up so you can get going quickly and, and easily on a fire. Lots of cool stuff in there. There's lots of new applications appearing all the time. I'm, I'm actually constantly surprised by how people are using dashboards and web apps and all these kinds of things to, to really reach out and, and get information out. So uh, next slide. One of the key success factors for the NIFC ArcGIS Online Org is what we call the National Interagency Feature Service. It's a set of uh, hosted ArcGIS Online services uh, that's based on our data standards from GeoOps, something we call the Event Data Standard. And uh, it's required for use by all cooperator incidents. And we have workflows published for how people can use the national services to share data. The key there is we've built a uh, Wild and Fire Enterprise GIS process. And people can go in there, share their data. It moves up through the chain. Um, and based on attribution and things like that, the data can then be shared out. I'll go into a little bit more of that in a little bit. Um, but as a GIS on a fire, if you attribute your fire perimeters public within five minutes, that will then be available to the public uh, on a load balance start just online setup so that uh, you can get that information out to your uh, constituents really quickly and easily. So we try and take a lot of the steps out of it for individual GIS users in order to get that information out. Can be used by all levels of incident response, not just incident management teams. Can be used by a single firefighter going out on a single tree incident or something like that. So really critical to know it's not just targeted to incident management teams. Uh, next slide. Another key piece of this, uh, Paul mentioned earlier, is IRWIN, which stands for the Integrated Reporting of Wild and Fire Information. Before IRWIN, seven, eight years ago, we had lots of stovepipe systems in wild and fire. And when someone had a wild and fire response, they would go into their particular system. Uh, you know, each agency had its own system, state and private had their own system, that kind of thing. And they'd enter their fire record. So there are fire records all over the place. Um, lots of conflicts, different attribution, all sorts of things so that these records couldn't be compiled to provide anybody an idea on total number of fires in the United States at a particular time. Had no idea. What Irwin's done is it is a, a data bus. And what that allows is it goes out and interact, you know, interfaces with these various wildland fire systems and deconflicts a lot of this data in real time. Uh, there's read write systems, dispatch systems, so things like uh, CAD systems, Wildcad. When a, system, when a fire is entered in Wildcat, it creates a record at Irwin. That record is then shared out to all the other dependent systems. So Irwin sits on top and really controls how the data flows. 
uh, up to two, it's got 250 connected services right now, which is pretty cool. So the authoritative source, that CAD dispatch, can create that record in Erwin and have it shared out to 250 different systems. And that's got a long way to really simplifying how we do fire. Uh, next slide, please. Next piece uh, I want to talk a little about is the NIFSI open data site. So as part of our ArcGIS Online org, we spun up an open data site several years ago. And the purpose of that open data site is, of course, to share data with the public. It's public facing. Um, much of the data in there right now, or at least what people are really interested in, is from the National Incident Feature Service. Talked a little bit earlier about how you can do uh, select attributes in there. Um, and it, we have tools that run in the background that look for those attribute flags. If attribute equals public, it takes that data and copies it to another hosted service, and then that service is, is publicly available. Uh, it's been really great for the data flow from the incident to the public. Some of you might be familiar with an old process called GeoMac, which could take 24, 72 hours to get a public perimeter out to the public. Um, we've shortened that to five minutes. So what you can do on the local level is easily share that data out. It ends up on the site. It can then be pulled into the public. Uh, it's, it's harvested automatically. This year, we only have fire perimeters and fire locations. Um, next year, we're gonna start sharing out all the data that we have as far as fire perimeters, uh, line types, you know, so whether the line is uncontrolled or completed, as well as fire points. So locations, division breaks, stuff like that. If the incident wants it set as public, it can then go and, and get shared out to the public. Definitely check that one out. Uh, next slide, please. So right now, the two biggest things on that open data site are the public wildfire points and perimeters. So those current wildfire points are coming from Irwin. We are providing a spatial view of Irwin data uh, out to the public. There's not a public system from Irwin specifically, so we're, we're filling that gap with the NIFC open data site. All that data is updated uh, constantly. So those points, uh, as they're being updated and fixed and acreage goes from 10 acres to 20 acres to 30 acres in Irwin, that data then comes down into the open data site and is refreshed, I believe every few minutes as well. Um, so it's, it's not real time, but it's near real time. And that data uh, is updated very frequently. The fire perimeter service talked a little bit about how it's attributed from the National Incident Feature Service. We have a feature access attribute. Uh, if you set it to public, it shows up in the service. Really wanted to point out, for those of you that knew about GeoMac, GeoMac had about a 20 year run on sharing out wildfire data uh, through the various browsers and things like that. It was an awesome resource. Um, that was decommissioned this spring and replaced with the data services coming out of the open data site. That's caught a lot of people by surprise, unfortunately, um, even though it was advertised for since the end of 2019 that it was gonna happen. Um, still some folks are being caught by surprise uh, that, that we've switched over. So please check it out, go out and uh, check out those wildfire services, you know, at the state and local level, federal agencies, anybody can access that data. And it is, it is very current. And next slide. So I kind of wanted to put this in there uh, just to show you the, the amount of use that the service is getting. Uh, this is the wildfire perimeters, the current wildfire perimeters service. And you can see uh, October of last year up until beginning of June, it was, it was pretty flat line, of course, the winter season and then it bounced around and then really took off with the California fires. Um, we've had over a billion data requests on that in the last year. Um, lots of public interest in, in, that, in that perimeter service. One of our high points there uh, a couple weeks ago was about 65 million hits a day. Uh, so we, were, we, we do some really big traffic on that public wildfire perimeter site. A lot of people tied in there, a lot of applications that are tied into that process. So check it out, see what you think. Uh, next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about something that uh, people might not be as familiar with at, at the state and local side. Uh, federal agencies more so. 
is a project called Inform. It's an interagency fire occurrence reporting module. And for years, you know, I, I talked about those stovepipe federal systems that reported data into their own filing cabinet, so to speak. You know, the Park Service, ha Park Service and BLM had one, Forest Service has its own, uh, states have their own, that kind of thing. So Inform is an effort to really break down a lot of those silos and have a single reporting module that everybody can use. It's based off of the Inform process, uh, pardon me, the Irwin process. And the Inform system is, is just another application that reads and writes to Irwin uh, and creates those fire records. Inform took it one step further. Irwin is a point data system. Inform is allowing the users to collect polygons and tie those polygons back to those point fire records. So prior to 2000, uh, from a federal agency standpoint, our official record was a point. Now, starting to being a 2000, our official record for the fire is the point and the polygon, which those of you who've done any kind of fire analysis or historical fire behavior or anything like that know that the point's nice, but having the polygon or the footprint of the fire is so much better. So what we're trying to do now is build an integrated data set, points and polygons of that information. And that's where Inform comes in. And Inform is really almost a fully COTS application. It uses Survey123, uh, ESRI Survey123, it uses ESRI's collector, and in the inspector application, which is a customized web app, but it is heavily based on ESRI side of things. So those three web applications or those three applications allow the users to uh, create a record if they have no CAD, no dispatch using Survey123. If they have a dispatch system, the records created in Irwin becomes available in Collector and allows the user to go out in the woods and uh, collect that, that polygon. Um, and then when they're done and they have that information, they can go into Inspector and certify that record to say that, yep, that's what happened. And, um, you know, I'm the reporting official and, and I certify that record. And that's a single system, which is really cool because we still don't have a, a, a good data set for fire history from the national perspective. And this will start building that. That system is available to all federal, state, and local users. You don't have to be a, a federal agency. You, some states are using it now. It's available to any state and it's available to locals that want to use it as well if they want to have a, a solid fire reporting system that uh, feeds data into an enterprise type environment. So wanted to bring a little bit up about Inform. I, I really think it's cool because it's a new process of using predominantly COTS tools to meet our uh, wild and fire needs, which is a big switch from the past where we had these kind of monolithic systems that uh, required a lot of cost and development. So. Well, excellent. Uh, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, if there are any questions that goes beyond this, feel free to reach out to me uh, personally. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I will take a little bit of time and answer some of the questions in the, uh, in the Zoom. All right. Thank you so much, Skip. We've uh, been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, not sure how it worked out to throw you right into the peak of fire season, but again, really appreciate your time. and. Um, look forward to, to working with you on this, helping get the word out. No problem. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, we're going to transition to another federal partner, but from a regional perspective, uh, Chris Stewart is the geospatial coordinator for FEMA region nine. He has nine years of experience as a GIS professional and has been with FEMA for about three and a half years with roles, both in region nine and region five. Uh, before FEMA, Chris was in the civil engineering consulting field, primarily working on renewable energy projects, and he's also a certified GIS professional. And I really look forward uh, to seeing Chris's presentation here. Um, FEMA, as you all know, there's a lot of work behind the scenes, and Chris is sharing with you some of the things that I think will be useful uh, for you in state and local government. And uh, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, as Paul mentioned, my name is Chris Stewart, uh, Regional Geospatial Coordinator, Geospatial Lead for FEMA Region 9, which um, encompasses the states of California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and 
all of our Pacific territories. So out here in Region 9, we deal with almost every type of disaster you can think of from earthquakes and landslides to, to uh, flooding, hurricanes and tsunamis. Um, today I'm going to discuss some of the workflows, tools, and products we use when responding to one of our most common types of disaster, which is um, a wildfire. So the map on the left, um, just to give you some context about the threat here in California, um, the map on the left was developed by the California Public Utilities Commission and shows where there is elevated hazard for uh, the ignition and rapid spread, specifically of power line fires due to uh, strong winds, abundant dry vegetation, and other environmental conditions. As you can see, this threat is geographically very large and has been responsible for almost every um, major wildfire in California the past few years. Um, so this, this wildfire threat truly affects almost every corner of our state. Um, as I'm sure you are all aware of, we're currently experiencing an unprecedented system of wildfires that are uh, tearing across California as we speak. These wildfires actually weren't ignited by power lines at this time. They were ignited by a series of uh, rare lightning storms. The map on the right is a map of all the lightning strikes that occurred over um, a 72 hour period uh, between August 16th and 18th. And um, there were about 11,000 uh, separate lightning strikes um, all over the state. Um, and these are what, um, what ignited the current wildfires we're experiencing along with um, uh, contributed uh, to that, um, to the fires was, um, was very strong heavy winds as well. So um, next slide. So what I'm going to focus most of the presentation on today is the situation at hand with the current wildfires in California and some of the tools we're using to respond to them. Um, at the beginning of a major disaster, we generally set up a map journal for the uh, specific to the event. So this is the fire journal that uh, I set up and it's currently being displayed um, on the big screens of the state of California's uh, Emergency Operations Center. Um, so we're, um, federal, state, and local partners are using this as um, a common operating picture and, and platform for everybody to go to and get the latest and greatest information on the fire, um, the fires. You can see we have quite a few tabs at the top of the journal that contains um, a lot of our incident data, um, different types of maps and services, anything important to the incident, we want to keep it all right here. Uh, so we have a um, single common operating picture to work off of. With all of this data, we have a fairly good um, preliminary model that gives us an idea of where we should focus um, things like our search and rescue operations, um, where we should position response resources and give us an understanding of areas that were likely exposed to the highest degree of the hazard. So this is the first tab, um, just our basic hazard overview tab. Um, it's, it's a map and a list of all the fires in California we're currently tracking. Um, this data is coming from both um, Irwin and NIFSI, um, their point and their polygon layers. Um, we've pulled those in and um, we're tracking some basic metrics about the fires um, in the dashboard widgets at the bottom. So, um, you know, the total acreage of the fire, the percent contained, how many residences and structures are destroyed, um, how many incident personnel are destroyed, uh, deployed. Um, and then we have, uh, if you would expand the, the list of the layers, if you're looking at this live, you could uh, toggle on and off other layers such as our fire weather data from the NWS, uh, smoke forecasts, uh, EPA's air quality index, 
basically anything relevant to overall situational awareness we put on this tab. Um, so like I mentioned, most of uh, the hazard of review information is, is coming from the NIFSI and Irwin map services, but we've also been uh, working the past few days to incorporate data that's coming directly from CAL FIRE's incident reports to ensure um, our numbers are also lining up with theirs. Um, so this screenshot is, a, I think it's a few days old, but as of this morning, we're over uh, one and a half million acres burned, um, 1,300 residences destroyed now, and I believe over 13,000 incident personnel that are deployed to the fires uh, burning across Northern California. Next slide. So right now there is a major push in the geospatial community at FEMA to pipeline live or close to live data and perform on the fly geospatial analysis in a fast moving disaster situation. As you're all aware of, uh, speedy data is critical for situational awareness and response. So we automate a lot of the data analysis using scripts that feed real time, these uh, real time dashboards and use these to directly inform our decision makers, both inside and outside of the agency. So for example, um, you know, where our evacuation zones are, obviously where the wildfire perimeter is. And uh, like this, this dashboard shows impacts to the exposed populations in the area. So we're bringing in an enriched map service that um, uh, that we're maintaining to feed a few metrics here. Um, we have automated the intersect of our fire perimeters with data from the American Community Survey so that we have a very granular level of detail about what the impacts for a population inside the fire perimeter might be. So things like number of residential parcels inside the fire perimeter, um, number of housing units, um, you know, what the senior population is, households below the poverty level, um, unemployment. Um, we can essentially bring in any metric that, um, that the American Community Survey is tracking and um, clip their data to our fire perimeters. Um, and this allows us to identify vulnerable populations that have been exposed to the disaster and, um, you know, really focus individual assistance efforts towards them, towards these populations quickly. Um, as these fire perimeters continue to grow, to grow um, they're, upda uh, they're updated multiple times a day and these numbers will um, update at the same time as well. Um, importantly, we have this published as a public feature service that we're able to share with, with uh, all of all of you are partners, um, which I'll, I'll share the link out at the end of the presentation, or the, the rest service URL at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So this is our evacuation zones tab. We've integrated a really great web application, I believe, I believe from Esri, um, that combines all of the official county evacuation maps into one centralized location. Um, this allows us to quickly reference and share evacuation zones um, as they're being updated. And there are li also links to access the official county incident page for each fire. Um, this has been uh, extremely helpful. And this is, I think this is the first time I've seen all of our evacuation zone maps from the various counties all collated into one centralized location. So um, FEMA tends to work on, on the big picture a lot. So we're, we're quickly moving from county to county, um, assessing the situation and um, providing assistance where we can. So um, doing all of that in one single page on our map journal has been really useful. So next slide. So this is our shelters tab. This is just a live look at how many open shelters there are 
what the populations of the shelters are and what their respective capacities are. Um, again, with this, we've integrated a live feature service into this dashboard so that when shelter data updates, the dashboard updates as well. The live feature service is hosted by FEMA and is plugged into the, um, the National Shelter System database. Um, next slide. So this next tab is um, our critical infrastructure tab. So this allows us to see all of our critical infrastructure layers overlaid with our fire perimeters so that we can view spatially what uh, what information might be affected by the event, what infrastructure might be affected by the event. Um, we have a wealth of uh, public infrastructure data in here from uh, transmission lines to schools, hospitals, nursing homes, you know, cell towers, dam lines, um, our canals and aqueducts that bring water from the Sierras into our major cities. Um, and water treatment plants, um, critical infrastructure like that. So essentially you can zoom to your fire perimeter, uh, turn on your layers of interest and get a good idea of what infrastructure um, is within the fire perimeter and what infrastructure um, might be outside of the fire perimeter that could potentially be threatened if the fire um, if the fire moves. Uh, next slide. So this is our uh, logistics data tab. Uh, this is also being fed by an enriched feature service that intersects the fire perimeters with some of our FEMA logistics system data. Uh, so this gives us a good idea of the quality of logistic, pro uh, the quantity of logistic products that uh, might need to be staged to assist the people inside the perimeter. So it's estimating things like um, plastic sheeting, cots, meals per day, blankets, um, water, you know, all of the, um, the basic logistics, logistical items that our logistics cell is, is thinking about. And um, this is all calculated based on um, the vulnerable population in the fire perimeter. Um, so um, again, these metrics will update automatically as our perimeters update. And with all of these dashboards, you can, you can click on the active wildfire on the left and it will um, zoom to the fire and filter out all the, all the metrics for you for that specific incident. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a really great power outages dashboard that Cal OES put together that we embedded directly in the map journal. Um, here we can see exactly where the power is out across the state and how many people are impacted by it. Um, we can even sort power outages by county or utility company and uh, zoom into a granular view that allows you to see where power outages might be all the way down to the neighborhood level. Next slide. So this is our Twitter web application. What this does is essentially scrape the latest georeferenced tweets on a map that contains specific incident related hashtags. So for this incident, we're searching um, hashtag LNU complex, hashtag uh, SCU complex, hashtag Cal Fire, uh, et cetera. Um, this gives us a very real time crowdsourced look at what the people on the ground are seeing and reporting um, and allows us to get situational awareness from the public outside of just the normal official reports being put out by the state. Next slide. So this is Cal OES's, uh, I must have forgot that slide. Um, so I skipped over just so there's another tab about Cal OES's um, dashboard. Um, we, we're deeply integrated with everything they're putting out and a lot of their data is, is feeding our dashboard. So um, unfortunately I don't have a screenshot of that, but um, the idea is just to have all of our incident related dashboards and web applications 
uh, regardless of whether we built them or the state or our other partners built them, combined into the uh, same, same common operating picture. Uh, so then we'll, uh, so this slide, uh, lastly, we've embedded our agency-wide FEMA Geospatial Resource Center, which is an ArcGIS hub site. So this is going to be the authoritative source for all data that FEMA is putting out. Um, here you can find map services and downloadable data for every other type of disaster we deal with. Um, they post imagery, predictive models, authoritative data, um, tools, and um, web applications, live feeds, um, historic data, all in one place. Um, we also have all of our Lifeline dashboards up here. So this is a great first stop if you're looking for live, official, and up-to-date geospatial data to integrate into your own um, GIS or ArcGIS online maps. Next slide. So just to switch gears, um, I wanted to, quick, out of the ArcGIS map journal realm, I wanted to um, quickly talk about remote sensing. So we also coordinate a lot of aerial or satellite or UAV imagery collection in the immediate aftermath of an event, specifically to support our damage assessment process. So uh, we work with our partners at NASA, the Civil Air Patrol, um, the State National Guard, and CAL FIRE to put together a collection plan, um, a, a flight plan, and um, ultimately get high resolution imagery immediately after an event as soon as we can. So we use this imagery to preliminarily determine what structures are destroyed, uh, majorly damaged, minorly damaged, or um, have no damage. Um, next slide. I believe this is an example of some of the high resolution imagery that was collected after the campfire in 2018. Uh, we piloted a project to collect 3D imagery around that fire um, that we could then bring into a map viewer that allowed us to essentially pan around the map and get a Google Earth-like view of things um, on the ground in 3D. Um, we use this for things like estimating the amount of debris, um, determining burned cars and down, down trees and power lines, um, and a whole slew of other important information. Um, we have this all in a 3D viewer that we could actually um, use to calculate volume. So if you have a pile of debris, you can look at it in 3D and trace your pile of debris and it would um, give you um, the X, Y, and Z of that so you could have a good estimate of um, the volume of debris on that specific parcel. Um, so we're also working to start integrating artificial intelligence into the damage assessment process, um, especially disasters that have damages that number in the thousands. Next slide. This is what some of the automated image classification looks like. Uh, we were able to differentiate from this imagery where live trees and burnt trees and grass are, um, where structures are and, and differentiate between non-burnt and burnt structures. So the idea is that uh, the faster we can perform these damage assessments, the faster we can assist our survivors uh, with getting into housing and getting back on their feet and remote sensing is just another tool in the toolbox for that. Um, I really could give a whole presentation on our remote sensing efforts, but just wanted to touch on some of the things that we've been doing in that realm. Next slide. Okay, so um, that's kind of a high level overview of FEMA Region 9's wildfire response um, tools and workflows and um, a demonstration of some of the data and web applications we use to inform um, situational awareness, um, response, and recovery. So hopefully that gave you a bit of insight into the wildfire GIS world of FEMA. Um, I've included links to the map journal here, as well as our enriched population impacts feature service. Um, both of these are public, and we've been sharing them widely. So. Um, 
if you have any questions about anything I presented today, um, just feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it was a great perspective. Uh, I remember seeing your first uh, maybe pilot of enriching the perimeters and that got me really excited and have been trying to spread the word, but this is uh, an awesome opportunity to get the word out. And obviously it's been a really uh, long month for you and everybody in California. So uh, keep up the great work and hope you get some relief soon. Yes, thanks Paul. All right, and um, keeping with the California theme, sorry for our friends in the Rockies, the Northwest and Southwest, but uh, we're gonna turn it over to, to Ben. Ben is a GIS specialist in Mariposa County. He's a truly a native Minnesotan. Uh, he's the current senior GIS specialist for Mariposa County in California and has been there for nearly four years. Uh, during this time, Mariposa has been struck with large scale fires, a couple of different flooding events, rock slides, and numerous power outages. Uh, I also might add Mariposa contains a gateway community, Yosemite National Park, which in and of itself uh, can be a disaster. Uh, ben is part of a regional group of GIS users called the Yosemite All Hazards Region. Uh, he likes to call it YAR. Um, and that uh, they share a collective goal of providing timely, accurate, and accessible public information during events. And we've experienced that here uh, recently with the mock fire. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ben now. And we'll do a quick comms check. Can you hear us, Ben? Just checking with our other panelists that we heard from Ben. Can you, oh, can there you he is. hear me now? All right. Yeah, worried you were. All right. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, well, that could happen. Um, I apologize. I'm working from home and my internet is uh, comes and goes. But I'll try to talk fast and show you what we our story. And I want to thank Paul and I want to thank everyone else for letting me share our story. Um, and uh, especially a shout out to Paul because as I'll just get into it, um, back in 2017, the Detweiler fire uh, came in, uh, burned really close to the town of Mariposa. We lost a bunch of structures. Uh, it only lasted about a week, but it was pretty devastating. And at that point, we didn't have any public information map program set up. Um, and so, uh, Fast forward a year and the Ferguson fire started and Paul reached out to us uh, and we quickly put together a public information map system with his help um, and some best practices. And <clears throat> so far it's been a pretty good success. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Can you still hear me? Yep, loud and clear, you're good. Okay, um, maybe my screen's delayed, but if, uh, if you can go to the next slide for me, if you already haven't. Yep, we see uh, the uh, internal situational awareness, you're good. Okay, all right. So that's our internal situational awareness map. Uh, it supports or it steers our public facing map. Um, in this internal one, there's all the layers that um, are controlling the public view layers. Um, and I just want to say that this map was, it's, our whole program is really possible with, because we have really good support from our sheriff's department and they bought into the GIS philosophy right away. And so we have our SARS folks out in the field using collector app and survey one, two, three to go door to door for evacuate houses for evacuations. They're the ones out in the field drawing these perimeters and flipping the switches when their statuses change. Um, so it, it's boots on the ground intelligence. Um, 
on in the screenshot on the left side, it's just a sample of what the survey one, two, three form looks like. It's not literally embedded in that map, but it's just on there. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Our public information map gets shared around in all the appropriate places. Um, it gets tons of views. Um, like Paul mentioned, we're part of a regional group, YAR, and with that group includes not just Yosemite area folks, but uh, Tuolumne County, our neighbor to the north. And we work closely with them and that was important in events like the, mock fire, the moccasin fire, which actually was in Tuolumne County, but we had evacuations in our county. So um, it was a good practice for uh, multiple counties to put together these public information maps. Um, let's see. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of the operational layers are in this map. Uh, there's links to other maps in it. A lot of the widgets are configured to uh, operate and edit and um, it's it's always a work in progress. So we keep enhancing it whenever we can and making it work and get it out to the public. And it's been a really um, positive experience to see the cooperation with other agencies to support this um, effort. And I think it's been a pretty good success for Mariposa. We're a pretty small county. We only have 18,000 people in the county and we're on a pretty shoestring budget, especially this year when we don't have any tourism. But it, it goes to show how we leveraged our GIS capacity to do something like this. And you know, it doesn't really take a super sophisticated system to produce a product like this. And with just following some best practices, uh, we've, we've made a pretty good product, I think. All right, Ben, I don't know if you can still hear us, but you were loud and clear. Really appreciate your time uh, with this, especially uh, recovering yeah. from the mock fire and probably uh, you know, always ready for what's next. Hopefully, uh, so hopefully somehow it's a wet fall. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to take an opportunity, you know, again, to thank all of our speakers. Uh, we sort of typed up and cheated a bit on our, uh, our notes here, but we think the call to action, if you sum it up from all of the three speakers is, you know, uh, build your geospatial game plan, have a plan in advance. You now have uh, maybe new knowledge on how that these layers exist that you can have in your maps, but maybe you just, you knew they existed, but you didn't know the workflow behind them. Uh, while not every emergency management agency GIS professional is gonna get involved in wildfire response, we think it's really helpful to become familiar with the fire GIS workflows that Skip had mentioned uh, people are probably coming to you asking questions like, where does a perimeter come from and how often does it update? So um, I really appreciate that NWCG shares uh, their training materials and their workflows. So it's a much more transparent uh, process. And the better you understand that workflow, the better you can understand uh, what's left for you as an emergency management GIS specialist. As, as Ben mentioned, if the perimeter mapping and the new fire mappings handled, they can focus on things like evacuation, shelters, and road closures. And that's uh, really important is the train on your public information map workflows as we saw here in the past month in California. And then finally, um, if you are a local GIS specialist, when a wildfire does hit you, uh, you know, as, soon as, you're, as soon as possible, work through your chain of command to try to connect with the GIS or on the other end. Uh, they're in an incident uh, command post environment they may not know what tools you have available in front of you. And uh, by collaborating, we think uh, both the firefighting operation, but also the public information operation can be improved. Um, we've done, this is our, I think our third uh, presentation on the topic of game plans. So I won't go through this whole story map, but we've produced one for tornadoes, hurricanes, and then uh, Jared put this together for us on wildfire. So I won't go through all of it now, but it's a great opportunity for you as a GIS specialist or as an emergency manager or first responder to go through this as a team and just make sure you've got all these different uh, parts of the game plan covered. 
um, and see where your gaps are and uh, reach out to the community that is on this call and around you to, uh, to improve. And then uh, finally, just you know, some resources. Um, all the links from today are gonna be on the slide and I know Charlotte has uh, pushed them out through the chat. Uh, something we didn't have time to get into today is a uh, NAPSIG and Cedar Digital and GIS Core collaboration called Fire Mappers, where we are uh, trying to quickly map the location of new fires and then direct people to uh, the official agency sources for information. And it's been incredibly successful uh, many, many views on the map and lots of positive feedback. But uh, just a little thing that we're trying to do for the community and you can just look up uh, hashtag fire mappers. But uh, more than anything else, you know, thank all of you. Thank you uh, to uh, especially the wildland fire GIS specialists who are on the other end of this awesome system. And uh, someone was kind enough after the car fire to uh, capture a photo that says, thank you fire map updaters, which I think is pretty cool. So. On that note, I will end the presentation. I'll check with our panelists here on timing and, uh, and our Q&A. All right, Paul, we are uh, right at time. Uh, I think we have, uh, maybe we can take one quick question. I feel like you planted this question, um, but uh, will evacuation zone mapping become a standard across the country? Wow, I don't know. Uh, does anybody wanna take that one? I think, I think uh, from a NAPSIG perspective, we feel that the tools are there. Um, I think Ben did a great job of showing how with uh, limited resources it's possible. Uh, but Ben also mentioned how important it is to have a, a strong relationship with not just your emergency managers, but the, the first responders, right? Because a lot of times they're the ones uh, designating things like evacuation. So if you don't know your sheriff or you don't know your office of emergency management, that is pushing out alerts and warnings. Uh, it's probably time to go uh, buy them a coffee or a virtual coffee and, um, and have a chat. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's any national agency pushing for a national evacuation zone uh, standard, but uh, certainly starting from the bottom up is a good idea. I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add to that. All right, I think uh, some of them have been answered directly if they were really uh, simple and just passing a link. There's some other open ones here. Uh, we'll work with the panelists team here to compile those and work with our presenters to answer them uh, and we'll get something out to you soon. Uh, just as a reminder, this is recorded uh, as long as the internet uh, part you know, works well for us and the slides and resources will be posted to our uh, naptigfoundation.org event site. Thank you everyone for, uh, for being here today and uh, look forward to hopefully a quieter uh, fire season in the fall.